This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome to this lecture on thermal unit operations. The introductory chapter, I will tell you today something about the principles, how is separation possible in principle, and introduce one of the basic concepts of thermal unit operations, namely the concept of a theoretical stage. Well, how can we obtain a separation of components from a mixture in principle? How do they separate, so to speak? And the trick actually for the separation is mentioned here. We generate a two-phase system where in equilibrium usually the compositions of the two coexisting phases differ in the general case. I mean, except of course if you have an azeotrope or some other conditions for other equilibria, it can always be that some concentrations are identical, but the general case is actually that the concentrations differ. So we use that to get a certain separation of the components because if the concentrations of the two phases in equilibrium differ, that means that one of the components is enriched in one of the phases and another component is being enriched in the other phase. And that of course allows a certain separation. Of course just one of these equilibria does not really give you an up, uh, concentration that is very high. You just get the sort of or certain um, separation between the components. So if you want to reach very high purities, you have to repeat that step. So you have to uh, reach equilibrium after equilibrium. You have to apply many of these equilibrium steps in order to get to the pure components. And that's actually exactly what is done in thermal unit operations. So for example, if you want to distill alcohol, one of my favorite examples, so to speak, you have a water-alcohol mixture, you distill it by adding heat, you generate a vapor-liquid equilibrium and you get a certain enrichment in your distillation process. Possibly one stage, one of these equilibrium stages would be enough to give sufficiently high concentration of alcohol, but if you want to reach further in concentration, then you have to apply the same principle a second time. So you have to condense your first vapor and heat it up again to evaporate it a second time. Of course, cooling it down and heating it up, that's lots of energy. One can do better, as we will see later in this lecture. Now we have two options, actually, to generate such a two-phase system. One is by just adding a second phase. So you have one system, you have one phase, and you simply add a second one. Possibly you have done this this morning. Yeah, you have brewed your coffee or your tea, so you have a solid phase, you add a liquid phase and you separate, well, what actually do you separate? You separate the caffeine and the aroma components. Yeah, you extract them from the tea, of the, or the, uh, the tea leaves or the coffee powder. That's a separation process. Yeah, you leave behind some solid waste material that you throw away that is depleted in aroma components, depleted in caffeine, and on the other hand side you have your coffee or your tea which is enriched in these components. This means separation. This is adding a second phase. Of course there are other options if you learn it later that it, you can add very different phases, vapor phases, liquid phases, solid phases if you like. And the second option I want to mention to you is of course that you can change the state of the system by changing for example temperature or pressure. And I just mentioned that previously, my favorite example again, it's distillation of alcohol. There you have an aqueous mixture of alcohol, so you have aqua, uh, water and alcohol mixture. You increase the temperature until you reach a boiling situation. Boiling means you generate your vapor out of the liquid directly, you change the phase state of the system and generate the vapor and that le leads to the second phase where you can then enrich your alcohol. Okay, so we need two phases, 
and we generate them two ways, either by adding a second phase directly or by changing the state of the system. Now, of course, we want to describe that. Yeah, we want to describe the, how that everything works, so to speak, in order to be able to design the corresponding separation steps. And in order to describe that, there are two main aspects that we would need to take into account. On the one hand side, it's the position of the phase equilibrium, which is taught in the lecture on chemical engineering thermodynamics, that tells you how to model, how to describe, for example, vapor liquid or liquid liquid equilibria or other equilibria, whatever is required, so to speak. And you learn the certain models, you learn how to describe that thermodynamically. Well, and so we know, we assume that we know in this lecture, we assume that we know the position of the phase equilibrium or that we can describe it. Either mathematically or, which we will also refer to quite frequently in this lecture, is a graphical representation. We know how to draw the corresponding equilibrium diagrams. And then we use these diagrams that contain all the non-idealities of the system or that describe all the non-idealities of the system so as to design our separation process. Now, of course, in a technical process, we don't want to wait until we reach equilibrium. You know from this lecture on thermodynamics that equilibrium is reached only if you wait infinitely long. And since as an engineer we don't want to wait infinitely long, we want to have a product production rate which is finite, so tons per hour, which means we didn't wait for that ton for infinitely long, just some seconds per kilogram, for example. And that means that we don't reach equilibrium and we have to think on how to describe how fast we approach this equilibrium. How far do we get in a real process towards this equilibrium? And this is described in general terms by the mass transfer rate. How fast is mass transferred across the interface between the two phases? This is described by a lecture which has different names, transport phenomena or heat and mass transfer. So the name for that lecture may be different. And that lecture tells you all the details that you need to know in order to describe mass transfer across an interface. Actually, this lecture includes very many situations because you have to keep in mind that the mass transfer depends on different microscopic, how should I say, effects. On the one hand side you have the fluid dynamics, you have an interface, you have some flow past that interface of either phase or possibly one of the phases is solid, solid phase, doesn't move at all. Yeah, you don't know, it's one of the many options that there are. Then only a fluid phase would pass that solid. So you nevertheless have fluid dynamics of that fluid phase. On the other hand side, you have diffusive steps and you can have on top of that also reactive steps. And all that links together in order to describe or to determine the overall mass transfer rate that occurs in the real system. That's complex, it's complicated and is treated in this dedicated lecture. Here we want to simplify matters. But nevertheless, in order to discuss what we simplify and why we simplify, I would like to mention to you one of the major results from this lecture on mass transfer. This is one of the major results of that lecture. And the, it can be summarized like that. The flow rate or the flux of a component across the interface is, depends on the driving concentration difference on the surface area of the interface, or so the geometric surface area, and a mass transfer coefficient. Now we want to discuss these things in a little bit more detail and uh, discuss a little bit where we get the different parameters from. Of course, the flux is that what we want to know. N dot means that, the, well, the N is the amount of substance, the moles, so to speak. But usually one doesn't name a variable after its units, so it's amount of substance. And the dot means per second. So it is a flow rate of amount of substance. You can express the same, of course, with respect to mass, not with amount of substance, and you will wind up with identical structure of the equation, only the reference, so to speak, is different, or would be different in that case. You would have 
uh, mass-based concentration measures, weight fractions or something like that, whereas here we have really concentration, that means amount of, subs of substance per volume, for example. So this describes the flux, the amount of substance per second, for example, the moles per second transferred across the interface between the two phases that we have in contact in our separation uh, process. And this flux, this amount of substance flow rate, is now proportionally dependent on the driving concentration difference. The concentration dif difference is not just any concentration difference, it is a measure of the distance to equilibrium. So it's not the difference of concentration between the two phases, but rather it is the concentration difference in one phase as compared to what that concentration would be in equilibrium with the other phase. So you have to account for the equilibrium in some sense and determine or de de describe this delta C as the distance towards this equilibrium. The mass transfer area is all the area between the two phases. If you, for example, very frequently have one phase dispersed as droplet or bubble phase, you have all these small droplets and bubbles around, and the A is the surface of all these small bubbles or droplets. Of course, you realize already this may be sort of difficult to describe or to determine in a real technical process. Yeah? So it's a little bit tricky to apply this equation. And then we have the K. Now K actually, this mass transfer coefficient, only says, well, the flux is proportional to the surface area, which sounds more or less correct, and proportional to the driving concentration difference, which also is sort of expected. And now the mass transfer coefficient says, well, this proportionality holds, and, well, everything that we don't know about the fluid dynamics, the diffusion coefficients, all these things, how they are interrelated, that is now collected trickily by the engineer in this mass transfer coefficient k. So this equation now looks very simple and you have the impression you can solve it. <laughs> the trick actually is, of course, you cannot solve it that easily because the trick is how to determine this k it depends on the fluid dynamics at the interface, on the specific system that you have, and it depends, the, the flow rate depends, or the, the, the mass transfer rate depends on the mass transfer area. If you have a very bubbly system, or uh, uh, droplets or bubbles, um, you don't know that as well. It's not so easy to, de to evaluate that. You have to, to me de measure a drop size distribution in an extraction column where you have many, many drops with very wide drop size distribution. You have to determine how many drops you have per volume, how big they are, and from that you are th would then be able to determine this A. But that is a very tedious measurement. You don't want to do that on an everyday basis. Uh, unless you are working in a university, of course, then you may do that. But in industry, you don't want to do that. And the K, as I mentioned, depends on very, very many different um, conditions, flow conditions in the system, how the fl flow rates are past each other, yeah, bubbles, droplets, everything, uh, influences. Also, if you have internals in your equipment, as we will learn later, then you have these interactions with these internals in the equipment. So it's not so trivial. Now, even though, that means that even though this equation looks so simple, it is relatively complex to evaluate that. So, in the general case, you would like to avoid applying this equation. Well, actually, in this lecture, we will deal with one way to solve it, one trick, so to speak, how to take care of that. But, we also want to learn to a large extent a way to describe separation processes without using this explicit mass transfer model or description. How do we want to do that? And in order to avoid this, the application of this mass transfer model is to uh, define a theoretical stage. We want to use the concept of a theoretical stage in order to simplify matters. Now, what is a theoretical stage? A theoretical stage is a part of an apparatus or an equipment where the leaving streams are in equilibrium. So you imagine some part of your equipment, 
and the flow rates of those phases that are leaving this mental picture, so to speak, of some fraction of the equipment, they are in equilibrium. What is the advantage of that? Well, the advantage of that is that you can, uh, on the one hand side, imagine the entire separation process, the entire equipment, as just a succession of such equilibrium stages. And they are linked by the flow rates between them. Yeah? And you know the conditions, you know that the leaving streams are in equi equilibrium, so you also know which concentration one flow rate has that enters the next theoretical stage. And that allows us to model the entire equipment by a combination of two things. On the one hand side, the equilibrium information, which means the thermodynamic part, so to speak. We know to have to know something about the equilibrium. And for the interrelation between the flow rates, we have, to, we have simply to apply balances. Because we know what is leaving one stage is entering the next stage. Or leaving the equipment, depending on how you connect the different uh, theoretical stages to give your entire equip equipment. So this allows us to separate the entire equipment into individual theoretical stages that are linked in an appropriate way as to depict what's going on in the real equipment. That is how we regard an apparatus or an equipment based on these theoretical stages. What is now the advantage, so to speak, conceptually, uh, why we apply this concept of a theoretical stage. Now the advantage is that we can do two things separately under optimal conditions. Because one should first say, well, why does this concept make sense? This concept makes sense because this fraction of an equipment that corresponds to a theoretical stage is more or less independent of the specific material system that you are, you are using in your uh, separation process or on which you are, so to speak, performing your separation. So if you distill crude oil or if you distill a water-alcohol mixture, it doesn't matter. The amount of substance, uh, the amount of equipment that you need to represent one theoretical stage is essentially identical. So if you determine the amount of equipment that you need for a theoretical stage with one system, you will use the same amount of equipment for rep representing a theoretical stage for another system. And that is, well, that's the basis, of course. That means that you can really separate these two things that I mentioned down here. On the one hand side, you can choose optimal conditions to determine your equilibrium in the beaker, so to speak, in the lab, under optimal controlled conditions. You can have the typical equilibrium equipment that you use in thermodynamics, in um, chemical engineering thermodynamics, to describe for or to measure vapor-liquid equilibrium. You can use those equipment that you use for measuring liquid-liquid equilibrium under optimal conditions and under, under very controlled conditions. And even if the system is toxic and not so easy to handle, but you nevertheless, ne nevertheless need it for your technical process, you are still able to do that because you have only relatively small amounts of these uh, substances that you have to deal with in the lab. So doing thermodynamics with that is possible under very idealized conditions. Now the second thing is that on the other hand side, as I mentioned before, the amount of equipment that represents a theoretical stage is independent of the system you are dealing with. And that means you can also choose an optimal system to determine this amount of equipment that represents a theoretical stage. Now an optimal system is non-toxic. You can easily determine the concentrations. For example, it's easy to handle, it's cheap, and so you can really use an optimal system to determine this amount of equipment. And that way, actually, you have more or less a breakthrough, because now we know we can make up our entire equipment as just a succession of theoretical stages. And we know how to link the things, on the one hand side, using equilibrium information, on the other hand side, balances. And we will learn that later on as well, next lecture. Um, and we can, can uh, 
measure the two different things, so to speak, in an optimal uh, setup. On the one hand side, the equilibrium measurements can be performed ideally in the lab and the uh, optimal system can be chosen to um, determine how much equipment we need to realize one theoretical stage. Okay, with that we are able to describe the uh, entire equipment by a succession of these uh, theoretical uh, stages. Of course one should mention that this is only a simplification. In general, for more complex systems, that may not really always be correct completely, because, for example, this amount of equipment representing a theoretical stage, so how much height of a distillation column you need to get one theoretical stage, depends more or less not on the system, but in some cases it does. Especially, for example, if you have aqueous systems at a very high purity of the water, in that case the amount of equipment increases usually that you need to represent one theoretical stage. On the other hand side, there are other separations like solvent extraction or absorption, especially if you have some reactions going on, where this simple concept doesn't work anymore. In that case, you have to apply different methods and we will also learn one of these methods in this lecture. Okay, with that we have one possibility to describe the entire um, equipment based on this simplified uh, concept. And what we actually have done, we have now circumvented applying uh, on solving the mass transfer rate explicitly because that mass transfer rate is more or less hidden in this amount of equipment that we need to represent one theoretical stage. Yeah, if the mass transfer rate is small, then we need more equipment to realize one theoretical stage. If mass transfer rate is fast, yeah, then of course the amount of equipment is less. So the mass transfer modeling or mass transfer rate is, so to speak, hidden in this second uh, question that is mentioned here. Okay, with that I have shown you now how separation is possible, generating two phases and this concept of theoretical stage. Let's summarize this, that again as take-home messages. Separation is possible in principle by inducing a two-phase system and we have learned two ways how to do that adding the second phase or changing the state of the system. And I've introduced this concept of a theoretical stage, which allows to separate the equilibrium and the equipment considerations and allows us to get around, to get past this mass transfer modeling in detail. With that, I would like to conclude this lecture on principles and the concept of a theoretical stage. Thank you very much and see you next time.